We're going to take a deeper dive into the missing Massachusetts mom of three, Anna Walsh, case. Anna's husband, Brian Walsh, has been charged with misleading the investigation. Now look, there has been so, so much that has come out. And to me, it's kind of obvious. But one thing... One thing, the main thing that we don't have is Anna. Where is Anna Walsh? Now, I gathered up and put together the latest on the investigation, and I am going to attach the clips here. Be sure you subscribe to my channel for the latest developments on this case. Timeline that Anna Walsh's husband, Brian Walsh, gave to police since she disappeared on January 1st has been under very great scrutiny. We now have video proof that at least on January 2nd, one of the places that he really did go to, 47 year old Brian Walsh, went to a smoothie shop. That would be the day after Anna disappeared. She told police, he told police he had taken his six year old son to the press juice bar in Norwell to get a chocolate shake. And while no child is actually seen in the footage, Walsh appears to pace the floor there for several minutes just before 10 a.m. on January 2nd. He said that was the only place he went that day. After all, he was still under house arrest for a conviction stemming from his sale of forged art. But prosecutors say he also was caught on surveillance at a nearby Home Depot wearing surgical gloves and paying cash for a variety of cleaning supplies, including mops, tarps, and tape. Earlier that morning, Walsh had texted an apology to a friend uh, for getting a late reply back on a Happy New Year's message, claiming he had misplaced his cell phone over New Year's Eve and New Year's Day and that his son had found the device. And finally, with her husband in jail and Anna still missing, her, third, her three children have been taken into state custody and her friends are calling on the Department of Child Services to allow them to take care of the boys. What do you know about Brian? Uh, unfortunately, not much, because every time when we would have a conversation about Brian, it would be switched to children or brushed off. So we... What do you mean brushed off? Um, How did the conversation go? Literally switching the subject. So, and I said, and I, if there is anything, come, you know, it's, it's okay. And she said, everything is fine. So some of our sources that we've been talking to, some of her friends, have said that he had this no, her husband Brian, had this no picture policy. I mean, it's even hard to find pictures of her out there when we want to remember her, her life and try to get answers for her. Did y'all hear anything about that? Does that surprise you? There's no picture policy? Hard to say. She was hiding, truly. But the absence of him, I understand that even in New Year's Eve, my friend said that he would not even take personal photos for, between friends that he was missing in the photos in, during the New Year's Eve that he would take pictures of everybody else, but not of himself. So there must be some reasons for it. Um, I don't want to speculate what the reason, but it is odd. Did Anna have the type of personality that, if anything perhaps was going on, would she ever display it? Or no. was that against her personality? That's what probably we felt, that absolutely nothing about personal. And also at the party, she was alone. She was not with her husband. Even if she would be a sponsor. She never showed event. up to social settings with, with Brian. him, no. That was unusual. I have to ask you, and forgive me for asking this question, but do you believe Anna is alive or do y'all believe Anna is dead now that you know what you know? One in a million chance, that's what I would answer. And not because, because Pamela and I know her personally, how Anna is driven and how she's independent. Okay. She would find a way to reach out to people if something would happen to her. I, I, if the person is missing for 11 days, Nowadays, with the social media, with the world being connected so quickly, and with the evidences that unfortunately came up, and especially with the um, police reports, every day it's unfortunately looks dim and dark. When I just saw the post there, the, you know, the social media post missing, my stomach went upside down. Yeah. I knew something was wrong. So obviously we got to talk about the children because the children are in child protective custody right now? Yes. Um, you guys have spoken out about being concerned about their well-being and you don't want them split up. They need to be together. They need love, they need home, they need to be together. Everything what they have is frankly each other, right? And they need familiarity with the children who were interacting with them before. But we all deserve to know justice. We all deserve to know what happened to Anna, especially her children. Her disappearance has rocked the tiny seaside town the family called home and captured the attention of the world. What started as a missing persons case is turning into something potentially much more sinister. And at the center of the mystery is Anna's husband, Brian Walsh. 
This week, police charge Walsh with misleading investigators. He's being held in jail on $500,000 bail. This surveillance video of Brian is from a juice bar in Norwell. Police say he told investigators he went there on January 2nd. He also told police it was the only place that he went that day. But investigators say that was not true and uncovered video of Brian several hours later at a nearby Home Depot buying Tyvek, tarps, buckets, drop cloths and cleaning supplies. I-team sources say trash taken from a dumpster at Brian's mother's Swampscott condominium complex was searched by police at a Peabody transfer station. There, sources say investigators found trash bags containing a hacksaw, a hatchet, a rug, used cleaning supplies, and blood. All of it and the DNA now being tested at the state's crime lab. The I-team also uncovered a police report on a filed in Washington, D.C. before the couple was married. In that 2014 report, Anna claimed Brian threatened to kill her and her friends over the phone. No charges were filed because Anna refused to cooperate with police. Meantime, the Walsh's three young children are in the custody of the state and are facing an uncertain future. Here's how it all began. As the calendar turned from 2022 to 2023, something appeared to be happening in the Walsh home. What started with a New Year's Eve celebration turned into a desperate search for Anna. This is the timeline of what we've learned so far. December 31st, New Year's Eve. Brian Walsh and his wife Anna had dinner with their friend, Jem Mutlu. There was no indication of anything other than celebrating the new year. After that celebration dinner, Walsh allegedly told police that Anna, who worked as a property manager in D.C., had a work emergency. She went to bed around 1 a.m. and planned to fly to D.C. the next morning. Friends say their Happy New Year messages were never returned. January 1st, 2023, New Year's Day. Walsh allegedly tells police he last saw his wife between 4 and 6 a.m., claiming Anna left the house in an Uber or Lyft to the airport. But police say Anna did not get a ride share and did not board a flight to D.C. 7 a.m., police say Walsh got up to make breakfast for the couple's three boys. At the same time, a babysitter arrived at the Cohasset home. Walsh tells police he went to run errands and headed to CVS and Whole Foods for his mother. But prosecutors say there are no receipts or surveillance video showing Walsh at either store. January 2nd, 2023. Prosecutors say sometime after 4 p.m., Walsh, wearing a black mask and surgical gloves, is seen on surveillance video at Home Depot in Rockland. He's on surveillance at that time, purchasing about $450 worth of cleaning supplies. That would include mops, bucket, tops, um, TVEX, uh, drop cloths, uh, as well as various kinds of tape. At the same time, Anna's cell phone pinged in the area of the Cohasset home. January 4th, 2023. Washington, D.C. co-workers notify police that Anna did not show up for work. We received simultaneous reports from her employer in Washington, D.C., as well as her husband. Walsh's lawyer says he also called friends looking for her. Good afternoon. It's uh, Brian Walsh. I uh, hope all is going well. Um, I was just, just reaching out to basically everybody I could. Um, Anna hasn't been in touch for a few days. Do you know anyone that might have had contact with her? Uh, just, uh, you know, calling everyone. So uh, sorry to bother you. I'm sure everything's fine. January 6th, 2023. Police drain the pool in the backyard and search the woods near the Walsh's home. Later, a fire breaks out at a home on Jerusalem Road, a house formerly owned by Anna Walsh. The cause is determined to be accidental, and fire officials call the blaze a strange coincidence. January 8th, 2023, police arrest Brian Walsh, charging him with misleading investigators. Police armed with a search warrant search the home. Blood was found in the basement area, as well as a knife, which also contains some blood. January 9th, 2023, Walsh appears in court and pleads not guilty to misleading the investigation. His attorney says he's cooperating with police. Mr. Walsh has given several interviews. We have consented to searches of his home. We have consented to searches of his property. We have consented to searches of his cell phone. Hours later, I-team sources say investigators searching through trash taken to a transfer facility in Peabody from a dumpster at Walsh's mother's Swampscott condominium find garbage bags with a hatchet, a hacksaw, used cleaning equipment and blood. Those disturbing details stunned a close family friend. Jem Mutlu says he had dinner with a couple the night before Anna's disappearance. And a WBZ exclusive, Anna's former boss broke down in tears, talking to WBZ's Julie McDonald about the last time he saw her and their friendship. She became my right arm, and uh, and we became
we became inseparable. And her family became my family. So we're in absolute shock and, and disbelief as to Um, the whole thing is a tragedy, Julie. The whole thing is a tragedy. You know, you celebrate that New Year's Eve with like your close people and you were her, you've said that you were family to each other. She said, Jam, I know you won't go out on New Year's Eve. I know you'll just stay home by yourself and, you know, you know, Brian and I would love to see you. Just come over. Like if there's anyone we'd love to see, we'd love to have over to you, please come. And so I said, of course, Brian had cooked an elaborate meal for us and we hugged and celebrated and toasted and just what you do over New Year's. And, and there was a lot of looking forward to, to the new year. Like there was no indication of anything other than celebrating the new year, like problems on hold, whatever life's problems were. And life always gives us matters and problems and things to deal with, right? That just always is. But now the fact that they hadn't you know, they had been living in separate homes. She was commuting back and forth. She wasn't seeing the, the children um, as often as she would have liked. I mean, she loved everybody. She definitely loved her children dearly. And uh, so it was festive. She was texting with friends and, you know, she was sitting next to me um, at the bar stool and at, at their kitchen. It was, it was, there was absolutely no indication that any modicum of a tragedy of disappearance or anything else could have could have happened that night when brian was taken into custody were you baffled or you had feared this did you have any feelings before sunday or i did yeah i did i went to uh, i actually found out about her disappearance from brian on wednesday morning mid-morning um, i had texted them on sunday morning New Year's Day. I didn't hear back because the, the evening that I was there, Brian had said that he had misplaced his phone that evening. Brian texted on Monday afternoon around 2.30ish to say something to the effect of, yes, it's been great. You know, it was great to have you. What a trio we are. And, you know, here's to a new year. Something to that effect. I didn't hear anything until Wednesday morning when I was walking on the beach taking a morning, morning walk when Brian called and he sounded off. I said, uh, what's wrong? Is, is, is there something wrong? And he said, yeah, but he says, uh, Anna's missing. And that's when I found out and I said, like, I, first, I mean, I, I was in shock and, and, and I was in shock, but it didn't, it didn't hit me right away. And I said, Anna's missing. She said she had a work, he said, she said that she had a work emergency that morning and then had left off. I think he said that she left in an Uber or that she was supposed to leave in an Uber. Mm -hmm. But um, in any case, I said, you know, have you called other people? Have you called the police? Like this is, this is, could be serious and just make sure that the police know. Thursday morning, Brian and I were talking and he said the, the Cohasset police may be calling me, the detective, but I didn't wait, I called them. Again, both Anna and, and Brian had, have been individually and, and together very impactful on my life. Um, a part of me had this, this suspicion all along that there may have been foul play and that, that, that somehow it just the story wasn't adding up. My biggest fear had shifted towards the children. You know, believe it or not, I still have a modicum of a hope that somehow <laughs> I think you got it. While some friends were worried and emotional about Anna, others were raising questions about Brian's family history. WBZ uncovered court records with accusations that Brian stole money from his father. Our Chris Tanaka has an exclusive interview with a friend who says the relationship between Brian and his father was strained, and it was all because of money. To protect his identity, we aren't showing his face and have altered his voice. Brian was not like other young people. He was always dressed in our money and penny loafers. And he was like 13. I never saw him in dungarees. He just wanted the finest things in life. Trouble in the Walsh family may have been hard to detect, but it was there. Court documents claim Brian stole $1 million from his father. The family friend we spoke to said it caused a massive falling out, and the two did not speak for more than a decade. This was a kid who never gave his father an ounce of like, teenage angst. He didn't smoke, he didn't drink, he didn't do drugs. He was 
very close and he was very respectful to his father. He was charming. And when he did this, it, it, it like stabbed his dad in the heart. Court documents also show Brian's father, Thomas Walsh, the late head of neurology at Brigham and Women's Hospital, cut Brian out of his will before his death in 2018. There was indeed a will and there were specified inher inheritors and Brian was not one of them. Brian is accused of destroying the will, appointing himself the personal representative of the estate, then liquidating more than $100,000 from his dad's bank accounts. The family friend also noted Brian's 2021 conviction on fraud, where he stole a friend's Andy Warhol paintings and sold them, as well as fake versions of them. He was not trustworthy. He did things that were shameful and horrible to someone he really cared about, but I never saw him raise his voice. These are the fake Andy Warhol paintings that Brian Walsh sold a California art dealer as real for $80,000 back in 2016. I spoke to Ron Rivlin by phone. He tells me Walsh is a calculated guy, saying, I've bought over a thousand Warhols, and this is the one and only acquisition that got by me. He was that good. What happened to me is telling of Walsh's masterful ability to coerce people. He, this is not his first rodeo. He's already under federal charges and is, you know, being monitored at home. Walsh has been on house arrest for years after pleading guilty in 2021, but he still hasn't been sentenced because he was unable to produce the stolen paintings and allegedly couldn't come up with the nearly $500,000 he owed to three victims as a part of his plea deal. Now he's facing allegations he diverted money from his father's estate. Retired FBI Special Agent Jennifer Coffendaffer says more than six years later, this open case still hangs over his head. He is under a lot of stress and strain and pressure. Uh, you know, he's facing these charges. He's facing significant jail time, prison time, I should say. And that causes individuals when they're under all this stress and strain and thinking maybe he's going to lose her and maybe nobody else is going to have her. In a June 2022 letter to the judge, Brian's wife, Anna, wrote that he was a good man, saying Brian has been working consistently on breaking the past habits of his family and we're all looking forward to the new chapter of his life. But experts say his prior crimes could tie into the allegations that he misled investigators following his wife's disappearance. People who commit significant fraud type charges really do have a character flaw. And that character flaw usually involves narcissism and believing that they can, you know, trick people into believing their narrative. Part of Brian Walsh's temporary arrangement for those fraud convictions was actually to have a curfew from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. Now, investigators say he actually broke that curfew in the days following his wife Anna's disappearance. In the Satellite Center, Christina Rex, WBZ News. Well, this is a story with a lot of twists and turns, and we have been covering every detail in the case from the start. WBZ's Julie McDonald was the first reporter assigned to the story. Coming up, Julie and I sit down to talk about what was happening behind the scenes and where the investigation stands now. Since this story broke, the WBZ I-Team has left no stone unturned. Our Julie McDonald led off our coverage and shared her thoughts on how the story evolved. So Julie, you were there from the very beginning. What were people telling you then? Well, we were first assigned this story. We learned from Cohasset Police about this report of a missing woman in their community Thursday, January 5th. So I got in touch with some of her friends along the South Shore, as well as her close friends in Washington, D.C., where we know that she commuted every week for work. And everyone described this beautiful, driven, caring, bright, real estate professional, devoted wife, loving mother. Everyone just had the loveliest things to say about her that Thursday afternoon. But the more that we learned about this missing person case, the more questions we had. There were just some things early on that didn't seem to add up. We know that the family had hosted a friend for New Year's Eve for dinner at their home in Cohasset and that friend was at their house from about 8.30 at night to 1.30 in the morning. And he described a perfectly normal, happy, celebratory night. So he hugged them goodbye at 1.30 in the morning, left, and then the police were told that sometime in those next few hours, between four and five in the morning, Anna had been called for a work emergency, and as she usually did, would have caught a ride to the airport and taken a flight from Logan down to DC to respond to this work emergency. I questioned it in the beginning just because of that timeline, that you would hug a guest goodbye at 1.30 in the morning, and by 4, you'd be packing your work bag and responding to this emergency when the rest of the business world wasn't returning to work until Tuesday. No activity on her cell phone, no activity on her bank cards. The friends that I had spoken to early on described this social, accessible, someone who would snap a picture out the window of her flight as she landed in D.C. and post that to her Instagram story. 
So this just complete gone without a trace was completely unlike her. But these friends didn't find out that she hadn't been seen or heard from for three days after that. And did they think that was strange that no one had reported her missing during all that time? Some of the friends along the South Shore said that she had a demanding job that could be 24 seven. But at the same time, she's a mother. We know that she was very devoted to these three very young children. And so that was off for some friends that she wouldn't be calling to check in with the kids all day Sunday, all day Monday, all day Tuesday. Then it was on Wednesday that the husband, Brian Walsh, started to make calls to friends of theirs saying, have you seen Anna? Have you heard from her? At what point did all of these friends who were so supportive of, of the husband and so supportive of her and saying that, you know, that they don't think he was involved in anything sinister, has any of that now changed? Even after his arrest, when we only knew what he was being charged with, misleading investigators, there still were friends that I was speaking with who were saying, this is a distraught husband and let's just wait and see what we learn in court on Monday. Then we wake up Monday and the details that came out in court were chilling about some of the things that were found in their home, a knife covered with blood, blood in the basement. We know that the husband was seen on surveillance video buying cleaning supplies at a Home Depot. What were you learning from police in those next few days? Well, police started to track him with surveillance, with Easy Pass, with his phone, finding out the locations that he went to, and then they were able to get the dumpster from his mother's Swampscott condo. They brought that to a trash facility and searched it. And our sources are telling us at that point, they found trash bags with blood, um, a hacksaw, a hatchet, the cleaning supplies, all of it kind of showing and painting a very, very different picture than was painted very early on when she was first reported missing. I think people are wondering, okay, so what happens next? Can he be charged? And the answer is yes, even without a body, even without finding any remains. If the police are able to and prosecutors put together a strong circumstantial case with all of the evidence that they've been able to piece together, they certainly can still bring charges. This is one of those stories that like when I get home from work, it, you, you can't stop thinking about it. Two of Anna's little boys are the same ages as my children, so you can't help but think about what children need from their mother and how frightening this has, has been for them. A Revere couple says they were renting an apartment from Anna and Brian and knew her well, telling WBZ's Beth Germano they noticed changes in the couple's behavior just before she disappeared. I've done all the work here, wash and dryer for him. Mike Silva says Brian Walsh and his wife Anna were more than landlords, but trusted friends. Brian was very professional. He, like, he had me thinking he was an investor. He was always looking at the stock market. A contractor, Mike poured thousands of his own money into this unit in Revere. He and his fiance Mandy had been promised by the Walshes they could buy. But it all changed with a heated conversation December 29th when the couple realized the unit had been sold for cash to other buyers, and they said Anna's demeanor changed. It was out of character for the way that Anna was acting. She was being very protective. She was, you know, targeting us personally and saying, like, she should have done a background check on us. She should have checked our credit. Mike Silva says the Walshes owned a number of properties he helped with, like this one in Lynn, but was told they were recently selling off assets, which he thought was strange. I'm totally shocked. I'm like, uh, things was starting not, things that didn't add up was just starting to add up. He had texted the couple wishing them a happy new year and finally got this answer from Brian in a text two days later on January 2nd. Saying happy new year, sorry for the delay. I misplaced my phone and my son just found it. No mention of Anna, who was reported missing the next day. The couple says they had felt betrayed by the Walshes, and now with Brian facing charges of misleading the investigation and evidence uncovered at their home and in a landfill, they're not sure what to think. I can't take that argument back with Anna, so I feel guilty that I stuck up for me and my family only for this woman to go missing.